Hey everyone, welcome to the third episode of the Future Grind podcast. I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea. Today we're talking about the future of business and we're sitting down with futurist writer BJ Murphy. BJ is an affiliate scholar with the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He's also a social media editor and writer for the online magazine Serious Wonder. BJ is an advisory board member for the Lifeboat Foundation and he also works with Peter Diamandis' asteroid mining company, Planetary Resources. BJ was recently published in the new book, The Future of Business, and he'll be offering his insight into what entrepreneurial and business leaders can expect in the decades going forward. As always, all of our show notes can be found on our website at futuregrind.org. Please like, comment, rate, subscribe, share, whatever you can do to get the word out. We're available both on iTunes and YouTube. This is Future Grind. We have BJ Murphy here on this third episode of Future Grind. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So I've already listed some of your roles and the many things you do, and you have quite an extensive list of accomplishments. I know you're the writer and social media manager at Serious Wonder. You're an advisory board member for the Lifeboat Foundation, uh, a writer for the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, and you've even worked with Peter DeMandis' company, Planetary Resources, and and the list keeps going Mm -hmm. on. So how do you identify yourself, and what do you say when people ask what you do? Uh, well, the first thing that would come to mind would be to tell them that uh, I'm a career writer. I dedicate a lot of my time writing uh, for different entities. Uh, but the reality is that uh, if I'm going to be completely honest, it's that I'm a career futurist. It's just no matter what I do, and there's various things that I do, as you've uh, mentioned, it always comes down to my abilities as a futurist to help people try and understand where we're heading in the near future. And whether it's through writing or whether it's through uh, giving advisement on te- certain technologies for, for whomever, uh, I try and give it that futurist bent and not just any normal one. That c- it comes from a techno progressive point of view and a techno optimist point of view that I believe is unfortunately uh, too short in numbers of people who actually view the world from an optimistic point of view. So I try and give it. Uh, my greatest effort to try and push it and uh, convince people that we're not heading towards a dystopian hellhole. Which is kind of interesting because I noticed a lot of the art that you tend to post kind of has a dystopian feel to it. Um, Is that just something that you're, I mean, personally for me, I am very interested in post-apocalyptic things, you know, like the Walking Dead or the Fallout series. Those are things I'm interested in, but it's definitely not something I hope for humanity itself. So is that kind of your feeling on it as well? Uh, Yeah. Uh, You know, we've all grown up with the dystopian sci-fi. We all have that secret dark love for that kind of uh, genre. I grew up with uh, cyberpunk uh, fields and, you know, no no question about it. Those were dystopian uh, scenarios of the uh, futurist punks fighting against this uh, uh, corporate conglomerate that was ruling the world for whatever reason. And, you know, it's really cool to think about all that kind of stuff. But uh, in, in the end, uh, you know, the art that I tend to enjoy and what I write about uh, tends to be in polar opposites from one another. So what what first got you into the transhumanism movement in general? How did you get introduced to it? Well, uh I mean, I started off, I, you know, I wasn't even into science and technology when I was introduced to it. I was a political activist at the time, and I ended up bumping into this documentary called Transcendent Man. And, uh, you know, just seeing the things that uh, this Ray Kurzweil was talking about, uh, it really blew my mind uh, to the point where I started doing more research on uh, these topics because it gave a more optimistic view of the future that usually when you're in the the political activist realm, you don't really get that much uh, optimism or hope. You're just trying to fight every little thing bit by bit. And uh, when I started learning about transhumanism, when I started uh, reading about Max Moore uh, and his writings back in the 90s, uh, I grew uh, very interested in, over time, I started 
uh, meeting different people and started uh, using my skills as a writer uh, to integrate myself into it. Because before then, I was writing for this uh, online, offline political newspaper. And I decided, you know, I want to start writing about science and technology, something that I feel that could be a lot more beneficial uh, to our future of where we're heading uh, technologically than my writings as a political activist. And that's something that I would share as well. You know, I come from a background in politics as well. I, I spent some time on Capitol Hill working in congressional offices and you know, also with, you know, getting involved as much as I can in local politics. And it's kind of disheartening that I see that there's these big conversations that the world needs to be having, society in general needs to be having. And it's kind of pushed right. to the side for things that don't matter as much in the long term or the I feel like the priorities are not there. Writing and stuff like that and doing these podcasts is a good way to get the message out there that isn't currently happening in the political sphere. And I know with things like the Transhumanist Party and Zoltan's mm -hmm. campaign, it's starting to happen and we're starting to, you know, force people to have these conversations. And I think maybe with Bernie Sanders, you're getting a little bit of that, you know, let's talk about where this stuff is going. So it's interested right. interesting that one of the oldest candidates is the one that's I think most forward <laughs> thinking and in touch with what we need to be talking about. Yeah, an, an old white liberal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and speaking of forward thinking. You were recently published in a new book called The Future of Business, Critical Insights into a Rapidly Changing World. And your section of the book deals with body shops, which you foresee as businesses in which people off the street could enter and a short time and a few dollars later emerge with perhaps a new limb, an artificial organ, a new sense, or some other human augmentation. What first got you interested in the idea of body shops and what do you foresee these businesses being like? Well, my book goes into uh, a topic that I've been thinking about for quite a while, uh, simply because, you know, I uh, come from uh, a background of biohacking. Uh, you know, uh, when I first met a lot of the biohackers from the grindhouse wetware uh, folks to uh, dangerous things, uh, you know, these things interested me because I was someone who was always interested in piercings and body augmentations and tattoos. And I just saw that biohacking was that next step, you know, is that next extreme step to uh, push the boundaries of where the human body goes. And I started thinking about, you know, how far can we go with this? You know, how, uh, whether we're talking about uh, medical enhancements or augmentations or non medical. Uh, enhancements, augmentations, we're going to be heading towards a future where there are going to be these body shops that I like to call them, uh, where people will just be able to walk in, whether they're enhanced already or not, they'll be able to walk in as a human and then walk out uh, essentially as a cyborg, or if they're already a cyborg, uh, by the definition, they could, you know, people will be swapping prosthetic legs or arms or whatever they have that is uh, cybernetically uh, artificial, uh, just like people today go in and swap out new pairs of glasses. And I thought, that, you know, that's going to be an interesting topic and one that's going to be more relevant to society here in the uh, coming decades uh, that I, I wanted to really uh, dedicate a, a chapter on this and uh, help people understand where we're heading and essentially help uh, future business leaders because that's where the book was targeting. Uh, help them try and understand, you know, where we're heading and try to get them on board and try to get them prepared for what's to come. And I would agree that it does seem that the body mod community is definitely at the forefront of this. You know, a lot of the stuff they do, whether it's tattoos or piercings or even some of the more extreme things such as silicone implants, are mainly for aesthetic reasons. They do it because they want to express themselves, they want to change the way they look, and, you know, that's great, more power to them. Um, and then when you get to the biohacking, a lot of it is for functional reasons. So do you have any implants yourself or any augmentations yourself that would be more functional than aesthetic? Un unfortunately, I do not. Uh, you know, despite my absolute love for everything about biohacking, I've yet to uh, get any biohacking done. I'm wanting to uh, really soon. But, uh, you know, around here, I live in this small town where, you know, people are still having debates as to whether or not tattoos should be prudent in open society. It, trying to get a uh, uh, little gadgets inside of my body, you know, that's going another step further and hopefully I'll be able to here soon. But, uh, you know, I don't have any specific, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, qualms on, uh, how far I'd want to take it, uh, whether it's for medical reasons or not, 
uh, I, th- I think it's just a, a fascinating topic and it, people should definitely emphasize that this is an individual choice uh, that, you know, these are individuals that are wanting to test the limits of their bodies. And I don't think that we should get in the way of way of something like that, regardless if it's for medical intent or not. So that's a little side note here that I just want to put out is, you know, you you're interested in getting these things done, but you live in a place where that's not currently possible. And that's a problem that we're right. facing. I hear a lot of people emailing me or I hear of people who want to get finger magnets or RFIDs or even something more extreme, and they just don't have the ability to do it. Unless mm-hmm. you live in a city that's one of the hubs of this, you know, San Francisco or Boston or even Pittsburgh, where I live, is kind of a hub of this kind of thing where you can get that right. done and it's available. Um, and there's a lot of concern with transhumanism that will it create a separate group of people? Will there be the augmented that are kind of the rich or elite or have the access to the technology and then the people that for whatever reason don't have access. And, you know, I think the transhumanist community in general wants to make sure that that's not the case, that this is all open source and available to everyone. But, you know, we're seeing the small steps of that now where if you live in Iowa, you might want a magnet, but you can't get one unless you decide to cut yourself open. And that's kind of a safety issue. So we're already seeing the (laughs) the small things of that. So the, when these body shops that you mentioned do come about, and I think they will certainly come about within the next few decades at the latest, uh, that'll open this up to more people. And one thing that I'm curious about is I wonder, since the body mod community is the leader of this, do you think current piercing studios, some of them will evolve into these body shops? Or do you think it'll be a new system that comes up with more of a blending of medical and technology opening their own shops? Uh, well, uh, on my, in my chapter, I emphasize that I don't believe that it will take on the shape of uh, any single entity. I don't think it's going to be uh, just one huge corporation that, you know, a single person goes, it's the Walmart of body mods. I don't think it's going to be something like that uh, entirely. I think that there will be larger conglomerates of it, and there's going to be more small town, local um uh, body shops that people will be able to go to and how they integrate it, whether it's an integration with the tattoo and piercing community, or if it's uh, more of an integration with that of the medical community, depending on how much medical oversight, which would also depend on what kind of enhancements that each different shop uh, adheres to. It'll also depend on all those conditions. But, uh, you know, if a person eventually, once that time comes, if someone wants a specific enhancement augmentation, uh, they'll just need to figure out uh, the more prudent location and uh, go from there. And one of the things I think you've mentioned before is kind of interesting where the people who have prosthetics now or have augmentations of some type, a, a pacemaker or a cochlear implant, are usually people who have already had that happen through the health system. You know, they've had a right. limb removed for some reason, be it an accident or a disease or something, and then they get a prosthetic. And you see people who realize in many ways, the prosthetic is better than their biological limb. And some of them even ask to get their remaining biological limb removed so that they could, you know, function better. So in some ways, the first people who are going to experience this and actually have more capabilities are the people who are currently considered disabled. And I think that's when you'll hit that tipping point where people with normally functioning biological limbs are going to realize hey, that person who lost both his legs can now run faster than me and he doesn't get tired. I want that too. I think personally it is going to move from a medical field to more of a a, a different thing. I know Tim Cannon always makes the argument that biohacking is not medical. While the medical field is involved in biohacking, I I would argue that any surgery is biohacking. In the same way he thinks that it's kind of a, a different thing it shouldn't it shouldn't be judged by the same things because the medical industry is focused on making people better and they're very risk averse you know they're not going to want to do something that could potentially injure you that's not worth it whereas biohacking and body autonomy you you say i understand the risks i want to do it anyway and i think that's his argument that that's a different thing how would you uh, tackle that issue uh well um well, let me first uh, mention, uh, you know, you're spot on about, you know, the disabled community are going to be the first to really embrace this future of uh, transhumanism. Uh, it, and it's quite ironic, you know, we consider them disabled now, but then in that future, we're the ones who are able-bodied are going to be the new disabled. And that's just going to, you know, it's, switch, it's the, uh, switching the 
uh, definition of what it is to be disabled. And that's going to definitely move the talk of biohacking from medical to non-medical. Uh, but I do believe that uh, to some extent, uh, Tim is correct. Uh, and so far that there right now, there is a clear difference between biohacking and uh, the medical industry of like plastic surgery and stuff like that. Uh, you know, one has medical oversight and they're more risk averse. And then there's the biohacking, which, you know, right now it's more underground DIY. And we just see something that's really cool. And it's like, okay, well, you know, get to me straight. How far do we have to go? How much pain? Okay, let's get it done. But the goal, I, you know, I would argue that, I don't know if Tim would agree with me or not, but I would argue that the ultimate goal for most biohackers would be that, you know, we do integrate biohacking into the medical industry, that we do get to the point where the medical industry accepts biohacking and gives it the proper medical oversight that it needs because it does need uh, medical oversight. Uh, just like, you know, just, you know, just like uh, abortions, you know, if, you're, if people are going to have abortions, women are going to have abortions, regardless if you criminalize it or if you don't give it any proper regulations or not. But it, it's nice to have a doctor actually overseeing, a real doctor overseeing the procedure. And just like with biohacking, it would be nice to actually have someone who knows what they're doing uh, to be overseeing the entire thing and making sure that your biohack is as efficient as possible. So eventually, we're going to have to start blurring the two industries. And that is one of the things that I actually went into in the chapter on the book was uh, body shops is going to be an integration of a like the plastic surgery field. You know, we are essentially transforming the plastic surgery industry into uh, something similar to that of like fast food. People today prefer fast food over restaurants in increasing numbers because it's fast, it's uh, abundant in numbers, and it's cheap. And when you think of plastic surgery, well, not so much. It's not fast, it's not cheap, and it's not abundant. Uh, but we're eventually going to reach a point where we'll be able to transform the field where they are fast, cheap, and in abundant of numbers. And once we're able to do that, we'll have transformed the industry completely and be able to integrate it with that of biohacking. I would agree 100%. I, I think, you know, a lot of people that are interested in biohacking would love to go to a medical doctor and a hospital in a clean lab with, you know, surgical equipment right. to get these things done. But the current insurance regulations and red tape and the doctors just legally aren't allowed to do those types of things. And that's something that needs to change quickly. Otherwise, what's going to happen is a biohacker is going to try to go to a piercer and piercers are very experienced and they're great at what they do, but oh, yeah. they're not medical doctors and right. someone is either going to try it themselves or go to a piercer and they're going to get hurt. And mm. you know, that's something that we're going to face. And you know, you're going to face that in any industry, you know, the early aviation pioneers, they didn't want to die, but they took the <laughs> risks because they right. realized that it was worth it in the long run. And you know, transhumanists, the goal is to live as long as you want and to have the abilities you want. So, of course, I don't think any true transhumanist is going to put themselves too much on the line when their goal is preserving themselves. Right. But one interesting thing about the future of business is we often think of business as, you know, a private company giving goods for money. And a lot of times, especially in their current political sphere, business is equated with capitalism. If you're considered pro-business, you are, you know, anti-regulation, anti-organized labor, pro-profit margins for the sh shareholders. Right. Uh, what do you I, think that's going to be like in the future of this transhumanist world where robots are taking jobs? Right. Uh, well, it's definitely an interesting topic, and, it, and it's one that's so near and dear to me because, like I said, I was a political activist before I ever got involved in science and technology, and I was an activist of the anti-capitalist nature. And getting involved with transhumanism, which meant also getting involved with, uh, you know, as it grew with uh, business CEOs and stuff like that, I had to start really rethinking how I was to approach, you know, transhumanism. And I started noticing that there are a lot of CEOs who, who are, you know, of, of a futurist oriented mind who are thinking in a post capitalist way. And but they understand that right now we do live in a, a capitalist system and that we need to play by its rules to a certain extent. And 
uh, it, it goes into the point of, you know, capitalism is a stage and we need to play by its rules, but eventually we need to start thinking uh, in the long term, you know, and we are heading towards something that is going to be post-capitalism uh, in nature because, you know, like you said, robots are going to be taking our jobs. Uh, you know, automation is increasing at an exponential rate and eventually it's going to reach a point where like, like 3D printing, you know, it's, there's an interesting quote. Uh, it used to be misattributed to that uh, Russian revolutionary uh, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, but no one knows who originally said the words, but it was interesting. It said, uh, uh, the capitalist will sell us the rope with which we will hang them with. And I thought, wow, that's sort of like 3D printing. They're handing us the technology that will eventually meet their own demise. You know, Eventually, we'll be able to use 3D printers to print anything we want without any uh you know this profit margin that's in in between the business structure and one of the things that i liked about uh the future business book was there were authors there who were thinking from a post-capitalist point of view thinking about how things are going to change in the business structure uh and how we do business and how we start looking at things like labor and income and uh you know profits you know what you know what are we trying to aim for are we just trying to become billionaires for the sake of being billionaires or are we trying to become billionaires by helping a billion people are we trying to uplift humanity and i think one of the biggest emphasis was that we need to bring everyone along for the ride and not just a select few at the top yeah i think you made a good point there you know jason silva made that campaign the redefined billionaire that is you know it's not a billionaire is not someone who has a billion dollars it's someone who impacts a billion people in a positive right. way and you know you see this industry change happened already, music and movies and journalism even in writing, where it was democratized by the internet and people can make podcasts and blogs and their own movies on an iPhone and use YouTube and Vimeo to get them out there. And it kind of really democratized the system. And I think that's what 3D right. printers are going to do with manufacturing. Whereas right now, you you know, there is a barrier of entry in manufacturing. If you have an idea for a product, you have to have quite a lot of capital to get it made. But with 3D mm -hmm. printers, that's completely changed. You can download a file and print whatever you want. And right now it's mainly with plastic, but that's quickly moving into metals and glass and other substances as well. And even we're working on food with that too. So yeah. you know, this is completely yeah. going to change everything. And I think that's great. So the people that always say, oh, I refuse to use an automated checkout machine at a grocery store, or I refuse to use <laughs> one of the automated ordering systems that you might see at a restaurant because that's taking someone's job. And I think there's nothing better than taking someone's job in that way because mm. it, it's such a waste that humanity is kind of forced by this current system to toil in monotony for something that a robot could do just so that they could receive the money necessary for food, for healthcare, for lodging. When you let people follow their passions, a lot of people say, oh, if they didn't have to work, they'd just be fat and lazy and just do, you know, watch TV or play video games. But I don't think that's the case. You know, if, if I was a billionaire, I'd never had to work. I, I would, you know, follow my passions. I would read books right. and learn things and explore. I don't think I'm alone in that regard. I think the majority of humanity would follow me in that. And that's why I, I would personally advocate for something such as, you know, a universal minimum basic income for these people right. that, you right. know, what if a job is replaced, that's fine, you know, get an education, learn learn about medicine. Maybe you could be the one to cure cancer, but you can't because you're forced to work in McDonald's. So that's that would be my personal take on that. Do you, would you agree with that or do you have a different point of view? Oh, I, I agree 100%. You know, uh, I, you know, I keep going back to my politi political background, but you know, back then I was fighting for workers' rights. And then when I got involved in transhumanism and started thinking about this in the long term, and I saw, wow, uh, you know, my original views of trying to fight for workers of keeping their jobs as, as um, for as long as possible. You know, I'm fighting against an entity that is not human in nature. Uh, I'm fighting a uh, technological employment, and this is going to occur regardless. And I started thinking in terms of, you know, okay, then how are we going to help protect the unemployed then? Maybe that's going to be the new workers' rights movement of the future. You know, how are we going to protect the workers who no longer have to work and uh, you're you're correct in the you know the initiative for a universal basic income uh, nothing makes more sense than to try and redefine what it means to uh, to have income and 
do you need to produce some kind of labor? Do you need to prove to society that you're worth to live, to worth to have the basic necessities of life? And I don't think that you need to prove anything for that. If you are alive in this world, then you should be taken care of uh, to a certain degree where you are self-sustainable. And the only way we can do that is by right now in a, uh, a society that requires currency, uh, we need to re start redefining what it means to have income. And that goes in line with the universal basic income to start providing money, a certain uh, uh, currency of money to uh, every individual, regardless of whether or not they have a job. And I think probably a lot of people listening to this probably just got very upset at our points of view on this. You know, there is a lot of other <laughs> points of view, and that gets into the conversation of what are the ethics surrounding this? What is right to do and what is moral to do and what, you know, it should society agree as a whole? And I think a lot of your writing with the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies kind of gets into a little bit of that. You know, you've had some controversial posts recently on there, not necessarily people, you know, angry at you, but controversial topics such as suicide and the right to die the potential for a cyborg to be a gender identity and how, you know, virtual reality to, will affect sex laws. And right. I think it's great that you're writing these things because it, it is conversations that people need to face. Uh, we need to have answers in place before we move forward. You see things like drones, which are already becoming quite common. I have a drone myself and I, I love, you know, yeah. flying it and getting great visual pictures. And if I could do something functional with that, I would be open to that as well. But the regulations currently aren't in place yet and there's a lot of fear that once these regulations are in place people who currently fly Jones will no longer be able to do so um, so the regulation needs to be there and we need to have the government having these conversations what do you think would be perhaps the most important topic that should be discussed that you think people are kind of overlooking now that is coming quickly well uh, you know my you know, there was a reason why I, I written about uh, body shops and biohacking for the first book for this new series, and that was because you know it's one of the things that I'm most interested in, and that is cybernetics and biohacking. And the thing that people really need to start uh, thinking about is the ownership of your own body. Uh, if you were to uh, get you know an artificial heart. Um, to replace your actual heart, you should have the right to own that heart. It is your heart. It's what's keeping you alive. It shouldn't be some contract-based corporation where they are saying, no, no, you, you do not own it. We own it. We determine whether or not you live. And I, I think that is an absurd notion, but it's a, something that we've already have been dealing with. Uh, I remember talking with Tim about where he mentioned how a friend of his wanted to uh, hack uh, one of his uh, prosthetics that was keeping him alive. And he couldn't because of the contract that was uh, based on uh, the surgery and for the product itself, and they wouldn't allow him. And that's when it started getting more uh, relevant to society as we continue replacing our body parts with more artificial systems. You know, do we actually own our bodies or... Do we actually own the parts that is, are keeping us alive and to what extent? And if we don't, then we need to start figuring out why that is and try and figure out a plan to uh, flip the script and allow us to actually have ownership of our bodies and not some uh, corporation with other uh, ideas in mind. And that's a very relevant point when you're talking about technology and physical hardware but when you get into other forms of transhumanist technology which you might also see in these body shops which would be biological manipulation whether it's genes mm -hmm. or something in that regard and there's a big controversy now with farmers and such where can you can you patent a seed can you make a seed and patent that can you basically patent the dna of life and I think mm -hmm. you're going to see that going forward with humans, where people might dis discover certain genes or, or, or organizations of biological data that make certain things possible, maybe make you smarter, or make your hair blonde, or any other color you would want it to be. And is that something that could be patented and then owned? And I, I would argue that it shouldn't be, but I think that's something that we're going to see with these body shops, where you'll have maybe under one roof or maybe in separate roofs, where you'll have the biological one where you go in and get genes manipulated, and then the one where you would maybe change a limb or an organ or some other external thing. And that is another issue is when the topic of designer babies, you talk about body autonomy, 
but do you have the autonomy to ch- completely change the genetic makeup of an infant, a fetus, or even a child? And what, what do you think the answer to that would be? Uh, when it gets to infants, uh, I think we need to emphasize uh, a certain uh, regulation. And, you know, this is the reason why I support uh, designer babies insofar that I want it to become legal uh, and thus regulated. Uh, because we are going to need some regulations with a designer because it's going to happen regardless you know regardless if we try and criminalize it there are still going to be people out there who are going to be able to uh, genetically modify uh, uh, the dna of an infant or an embryo that's simply because genetic uh, gene modifying technologies and tools are becoming increasingly cheap I mean, much a lot cheaper than people really understand. Uh, th- you know, this is going to be a common tool in every kid's uh, biohacking lab in their basement, eventually. And once they have the technical know-how of how to actually use this technology, which you know, with the access to the internet and all kinds of other things, it's not going to be that hard. Uh, it'll be a little difficult, but you know, with uh, the will to do something, we already know it doesn't matter who you are, what age you are you're going to figure it out. So we need to emphasize that there's going to be certain regulations to designer babies. Let's legalize it, but you know, let's emphasize on where uh, we should and should not uh, actually tamper with the DNA of a baby. Should we allow parents to, uh, under a medical oversight, that is, to alter a child's uh, genome to where they have a certain skin color or hair color or whatever? I think that's you know, we should leave that to when they're a little bit older and they have the decision to make that of uh, their own. But when it, in terms of genetically modify them to be immune to certain diseases or all diseases, I believe that is, you know, I'm, I'm a supporter of uh, the initiative of forced vaccinations in California because, you know, there are two sides of the... Uh, subject of who is being forced and who is not. You either force uh, vaccinations on children and we ensure that they do not get sick or we force diseases on other children because we refuse to vaccinate our children. Either way, we're forcing something on someone and we need to ask ourselves, what is the danger of that force? And you come to the realization that vaccinations is a lot better than no vaccinations. And I think we'll be saying the same thing with designer babies that we should uh, genetically modify their genome to where they are immune to cancer, that they're immune to Alzheimer's, that they're immune to diabetes. Uh, And once we become more of a spacefaring uh, society or a species and start emphasizing more on long-term space travel, we're definitely going to have to start thinking about designer babies because right now conception cannot occur in space simply because, not because it's not possible, it's certainly possible, but it's not recommended because a child could produce fatal diseases uh, in space because of the not just the low gravity conditions but also from the doses of radiation that astronauts tend to be subjected to while in space and for long periods of time. So if we're going to have people conceiving in space, we're definitely going to have to consider designer babies because we'll need to genetically modify them to where they are accommodating the low gravity and other conditions of deep space yeah and i think that's an interesting point you bring up is that it's going to happen regardless you might as well regulate it and i I think that's true and also by regulating it you kind of make it open that everyone can read those regulations and know what's going on rather than a certain few people having access to the technology and doing it something that the other people don't even know exists at this point and While we may be quite a while away from the point of understanding the human genome and the genetics and the DNA to the point where we can make these diseases completely curable or even change skin color or hair color or eye color or make any other modifications you want, and then you get into extreme things such as you see with some fruits that people are doing now and completely mixing species and cross-species breeds where could humans regenerate limbs, that's just getting kind of extreme, but theoretically possible with these well, scientists are working on yeah, it with so. these. Yeah. and one of the things that i always think of is you have people working on ai and biology and various different technologies and space exploration but they're not all moving you know we need to get these things all happening at once and the way to really get to that point is i i see two ways for it to happen 
one, you discover and make contact with extraterrestrial life, which I would love to see happen, but it, it's, you know, hasn't happened yet. So good right, luck with right. that. Um, <laughs> and the other one would be once you have designer babies that you can boost the intelligence of, and you have a group of these intelligence boosted designer babies who could make these human achievements much quicker and really, really right. force science quick. Uh, up quickly and i think that is when you talk about the singularity these artificial intelligence computers really get to the point where they can make these discoveries for us and if they are also being controlled or used or helped along by advanced humans you can really see a spike in technology there that could really bring all these things that different industries are working for all together in one and i think that's some of the things that ray kurzweil talks about in his book the singularity is near exponential technology writers are or thinkers are, you know, working towards. And I saw that you mentioned both of those people in a recent article you did for Serious Wonder about what's on the bookshelf of a futurist. And uh, you list yeah. some great books there and some of my personal favorite books. But w if you had to pick maybe one or two from that list or maybe not from that list, even not related to futurism in general, what would you say that people should be reading to get an idea of what to expect and maybe to be ready for this? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, not to try and push my own writings on people, but I would definitely recommend the future business, not just because of my chapter, but because there are uh, over 50 chapters with that book and each goes into a, a different topic. And it's from the minds of leading futurists today who are truly thinking about uh, what is going to occur, how we need to prepare. So the future business is something that is going to be quintessential to any person's bookshelf who is serious about getting involved in the future especially if you're a business leader uh, or want to become one in the future. As for, you know, I would actually recommend uh, Peter Diamandis's recent book, Bold, um, simply because he, he, I normally would say the singularity is near because I find the ideas is absolutely amazing. But in, in terms of Bold, he integrates a lot of what, you know, what we've been talking about for the last several years now from uh, Ray Kurzweil's singularity to uh, technological disruption and how it's changing uh, each piece of industry, uh, how it's changing society and where it's heading. And that information is going to be very essential uh, for people that are going to be living in those times and are going to try and get by with these times and to understand where we're heading, you know, that's going to be valuable information because you don't want to just jump into something that you had absolutely no clue was going to occur. So I, I think those two books would be the, uh, uh, the most recommended, in, in my opinion, that being Bold and uh, The Future of Business. And I, I definitely appreciate Bold. I think for people who are interested in technology or business or entrepreneurship in general may already know a lot of the things that are contained in that book. There's really nothing I would say too groundbreaking or unique that he says that you don't already know. Um, but just putting it together in one concise space and getting the message out, people should be thinking about how the technology that they make is going to impact humanity and that these are the areas in which humanity is going to be most affected, whether it's, you know, energy or transportation, including space transportation or healthcare. You know, these are the things that people should be looking to. And I think, I think the younger generation that's around now, you see a lot of that, a lot of entrepreneurial mindset and people focus on the future more than perhaps generations past. And I think may, maybe that's bias. I know I have only lived in one generation, so I can't, <laughs> can't compare it to anything else. I'm sure every generation probably says the same thing, but, right. uh, but it's, it's something to look forward to. And I see the technology is progressing and I, I would suggest people read that book or, or any of the others that are on that list. And, you know, I've, I, I've also recently read, you know, The Future of the Mind and other Michio Kaku books and, and things mm -hmm. from a more scientific point of view that, yes, this is what people are, are working towards, but from a physics perspective, from a scientist perspective, what is possible and when can we expect it? When you have business leaders like Peter Diamandis and more of an engineering background like uh, Ray Kurzweil and then the scientists all getting together and saying the same thing and agreeing that it's possible, let's work for it, I think yeah. that, that offers some credence to it rather than one background. Um, right. So I think we're nearing the end of our time here. Is there anything that you definitely want to get out there or a message that you would like to say? And also want to say, um, what? how can people get in touch with you or contact you or find you online and your work? In terms of a message to people, uh, I think that we need to really start emphasizing on the younger generation. You know, these, you know, th these people are going to be our future and we need to create a mindset for them that is looking at the future 
especially the near future, in an optimistic way. We need to, you know, people tend to criticize uh, utopian ideals, uh, considering it just as unlikely as dystopian. And I, I would agree uh, insofar that they probably, we're probably going to have a future where it's more somewhere in the middle. But uh, how we create a society is going to be largely determined based on what you know view do we have do we have a utopian mindset of where we're wanting to go or do we have a dystopian and if you know if we have a dystopian mindset then yeah we're still probably going to be somewhere in the middle but we're probably going to be emphasizing more on those dystopian elements and if we start thinking about well we want to create a utopia and try our best of creating the best that we can be and the best that we can create uh, then we'll be emphasizing on more utopian ideals, regardless if we're going to have something in the middle or not. Uh, so we we need to start emphasizing whether we're writers or artists or you know speakers or anything really. If you're involved in trying to help create the future, then you need to try and do so by influencing the younger generation and help them uh, create a more uh, optimistic. Uh, hindsight to where we're heading towards the future. Uh, in terms of where they can contact me, you know, you, know, you can always uh, find me on Facebook. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, you can always uh, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, you know, I'm always open to anyone wanting to contact me via email. It's William Jack Murphy at gmail.com. And you can always find my writings on Serious Wonder and the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. So, and to pick up that book, The Future of Business, you'll definitely enjoy that as well. Well, I'll definitely put links to all of those things in the show notes for this website at futuregrind.org. And uh, during that last little spill there, I thought of like 20 more questions that I'd be interested in asking you, but uh, I'll let you go for now. But, you know, you're welcome <laughs> to come back another time. We can dive into Most different definitely. topics and really go through. So thanks so much for being on. Oh, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Future Grind. Please subscribe to us on iTunes and YouTube so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. You can also find all of our show notes at our website at futuregrind.org. You can contact us through there as well. We'd love to know if you have any questions, suggestions, or concerns, or just want to get in touch. Thanks again for watching. This is Future Grind.